Okay, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for taking time and coming. Um, we, uh, here in Israel at least, the state of Israel has provided us with appropriate programming for today, which kind of ties into what we're talking about, that Tisha B'Av uh, is on the one hand timeless, but on the other hand, very timely, uh, very much connected to specific history. And uh, that message was very much brought home to us, uh, those of us who are here watching the news, and I'm sure a lot of you there are also watching the news. Uh, and uh, for the people who are in the South who are running to shelters, uh, at Tisha B'Av is uh, very much brought home. So uh, here in Gush Etzion, we we don't have that experience, thank God, but, uh, but we do connect with the people who are feeling that and hope that everybody is safe. And I guess that's how I want to start. start. Um, so like I said, on the one hand, Tisha B'Av is, um, it's timeless. There's a cycle of mourning. There are certain events and stories that we repeat over and over and over again. Uh, and in fact, there are people who say, well, maybe we should change some of our liturgy and some of our mourning in light of the fact that we now have the state of Israel. And certainly in light of the fact of the past 55 years that we now have the old city and the Kotel and Har Habayit. But there is a sense of timelessness and of mourning for past events. Uh, but on the other hand, Tisha B'Av also connects up to each generation. And it happens to be that very many events happen in and around the time of Tisha B'Av. Uh, and each generation connects its personal story to the tragedies, the timeless tragedies of Tish Abab. Uh, and we have expulsions and we have the deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, and we have the story of Gush Katip. And so many things are tied into this time period, this time of year, which is not accidental, as we saw in the past few days. Wars tend to start in the summer. Uh, and, and many communities tied their personal tragedies into the larger tragedy of Tish Abab. Um, in a way, kind of an inverse of Purim, right? We know we have communal Purims, uh, that, that different communities that were saved and they have their own celebrations. Um, just to tell everybody, uh, oh, thank you, the bombing in Buenos Aires. Yes, there are so many different stories. Um, there is now official source sheet, uh, but there are gonna be some sources just on the screen. So don't look for the source sheet. And also if you have questions or comments, please put them in uh, and hopefully I will have time at the end. So already from the very beginning, certainly from Chazal's perspective, Tisha B'Av is a, a Yom Mu'ad L'Puranut, right? A day that is destined for tragedy, already from the time in the desert, right? So we have the famous Mishnah in Ta'anit that talks about the events that happened, well, first on the 17th of Tammuz, and then on the 9th of Av. On the 9th of Av, it was decreed upon our ancestors that they would die in the wilderness and not enter Israel, Eretz Israel. The temple was destroyed the first time and the second time, Betar was captured and the city of Jerusalem was plowed. Now, again, Chazal sometimes play a little, right? Play a little with the dates. It's not always exact. We know that if you read in Tanakh, uh, at the end of Sefer Malachim, the beginning of the destruction of Jerusalem is actually on the 7th of Av and not on the 9th of Av. Okay, so Chazal say it stretches till the 9th of Av. Uh, and we sometimes will play a little bit with the dates, but much does happen in and around the 9th of Av, uh, starting with our time in the desert, right? And if you do, do the math and you can figure it out, it's not particularly difficult. And there are, there are rabbis who figure it out um, the, uh, the, the, the Muraglim return, right, from the land of Israel, and you have this crying, this right? We're going to see this other source in the Gemara and Tanit in a minute. Uh, and, and from that point on, every year, according to the rabbis, every year, people dig their graves, lie down in them on the 9th of Av, okay, and wait for that generation, that year's people to die. Because we know everybody's going to die before they enter the land, and it depends what year it's going to be. And they would lie in their graves, they would sleep in their graves until the 15th of Av until Tuba Av. Why? Because they weren't always 100% sure of the dates and Tuba Av, full moon, then we know that it's okay and people can get up and anyone who's going to die that year has already died, right? And that's one of the reasons we celebrate on Tuba Av, by the way. But we already have from the desert, long before the Mikdash is destroyed, long before the Mikdash is 
built. We have this connection of Tu Ba'av, uh, of Tisha Ba'av, and you can see it here in the Gemara and Ta'anit. Uh, it is further written, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Rabbah said that Rabbi Yochanan said that night was the night of the ninth of Av. The Holy One, blessed be he, said to them, you wept needlessly that night, and I will therefore establish for you a true tragedy over which there will be weeping in future generations, right? Atem bechitem bechia lechina, and you're going to have a bechia lidorot. Um, and again, like I said, many, many different things that happen, uh, happen at this time. One of the very interesting ideas uh, in the last few decades, right, in the last 70 plus years, we've had to think about how to commemorate the Shoah, how to commemorate the Holocaust. Uh, and already as the Shoah is going on in the 1940s, there's already talk uh, about creating some special day, right? The Sloan and Marebi talks about creating a day to remember, to recall this great tragedy. And there are others who say, no, 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 we have a day for tragedy. Tisha Abba Ab is that day. We don't need to make a special day. Uh, and this debate actually continue for a while. For example, Menachem Begin thought that there shouldn't be a separate Yom HaShoah. It should all be subsumed into Tisha B'Av. Uh, the Rav of Salvechik also thought this. Uh, eventually what happened is that we did get a separate day. We did get this Yom HaShoah, Kavzai and Nisan, connected to the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, and, and in a way, both days, kind of the Shoah gets lost between them. Um, Yom HaShoah doesn't have any real religious ritual to it, and it's difficult to remember. Uh, and Tisha B'Av has so many tragedies that the Shoah, even though there is a, there are keynotes for the Shoah, but the Shoah is kind of swallowed up in in all the other terrible things that have happened. But it, but it's in interesting to understand that there was this movement at one point to include the Shoah in the tragedies of Tisha B'Av, which is a, a classic Jewish response. Okay, so we're gonna go through some of the keynotes that look at historical events. Uh, obviously not all of them, and there are many, many keynotes, and you're gonna have a whole day of learning connected, and I know the Crusaders is definitely gonna be part of the story today, uh, but we're gonna take a look at some of the, the stories in the keynote. So for that, I gave you a, a little bit of a timeline, right? Uh, we're not going to talk about the story of Shomron and the exile of the 10 tribes, but that appears in the keynote as well, right? The keynote about Ohaliba and uh, Ohala. Uh, we have keynote about the, the exile of the 10 tribes. So that happens in 722 BCE. Of course, the destruction of the first temple, 586 BCE. The fall of Yodfat. Okay, we're going to talk about Yodfat and Arbel. Uh, the Galil falls before Yerushalayim, before the Horban, early on in the Great Revolt, 67 of the Common Era. 70, of course, is the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, the fall of Yerushalayim. 60 years later, we have the story of the Bar Kokhba Revolt. Okay, we're going to talk about that, Arzea Lebanon and the rabbis of the Bar Kokhba Revolt. Jewish life moves north, the survivors rebuild, and uh, and that's going to be part of our story of the Mishmarot Kiuna. Okay, so a lot of these different themes. We're going to jump forward uh, quite a few years to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, who we're just going to mention briefly, but he's so important. His Kina of Sion Halotish Ali is so significant. A little bit about the Crusades. Um, 1095 is the call for the First Crusade, and a year later we have the terrible massacres in the Rhineland, in the communities of Shum, of Speyer, Vormaisa, and Magenza. Um, the Crusaders come to Jerusalem in 1099. For the Third Crusade, the story of the Third Crusade, we have the terrible story of York in England and the massacre of the Jews there. And we'll end with something a little bit hopeful, which is uh, the return to Yerushalayim, the Ramban, and how the Crusaders actually inadvertently helped Jews come back to Yerushalayim. Okay, so that's just to give us a, a bigger picture of what we're talking about. So we're going to start with uh, the Kina of Chavatzel Tasharon. Um, one of the, the first keynote that we say uh, early on in the in the keynote, and this is the story of the Mishmarot Kuna. Okay, we know that the Kohanim serve in the Mikdash, but already early on, right? According to Sefer Divrei Amim, David already is the one who does this. Other people say, oh, it happens later. But in any case, the Kohanim are divided up into 24 different groups, 24 Mishmarot. They are spread out throughout the country. This map is going to be talking about after the Korban, so don't look at this map yet. 
Okay, they're spread out throughout the country, and the idea is that, and these they, they are listed in Degray Amim, uh, Degray Amim Bet Parakafdalid. We have all the names: Yeho Yariv, Yidaya, Pashkur, right? All of these important names. Uh, the idea being that each Mishmeret serves two weeks a year. Okay, you serve two weeks, not in a row, but one week, and then you go home, and then you serve another week later. Um, but each Mishmeret serves two weeks. That adds up, if you do that simple math, to 48 weeks. I, we have 52 weeks in our year. So this way, you are not always serving on the same time period, which makes it fair, right? Because if you were always serving on Sukkot or on Pesach, you have much more work, right? All these people coming. You also make much more money or you have much more matznot kiuna because everybody's showing up at that time. So in order to make it fair, it's slightly off of the cycle of the year. So those are our mishmarot kiuna. We have a list of them, okay? And the names sometimes change a little bit, but this is the basic list that you have over here. Yehoyarav, Yidaya, Harim, Sharim, Malkia. Okay, and some of the names are more familiar to us, some of the names are less familiar to us, uh, but what's important for our kina is that post Hurban, okay, the, the Mikdash is destroyed, the Kohanim can no longer serve in the Mikdash, we have a general move to the north, which intensifies after the Bar Kokhba revolt, Jewish life essentially stops around Yerushalayim, we have a general move to the north, and we have a lot of traditions about these Mishmarot Kuna that appear in the north of the country. Okay, uh, and the traditions come both from rabbinic sources as well as from archaeology, uh, as well as from piyut, and this is one of the, the most famous piyutim, uh, written by Rabbi Lazar Kalir in the seventh century, and it starts. We'll only do the beginning. Okay, chavatzelat hasharon is a is a nickname. For Am Yisrael, okay, we hear it in Shir Hashirim. There's another beautiful image. Chavatzel Tasharon is a is a flower that we have. Uh, it's a, a sea lily or a sea daffodil, and it's very unusual in that it blooms towards the end of the summer. Most, if you come to Eretz Israel this time of year and you travel around, it's pretty brown, right? We have some thistles. We have very little in the way of flowers, but the Chavatzel Tasharon is unusual in that it blooms in the month of Av. It blooms in in August, um, and so. So perhaps certainly the the Kalir was aware of that. He lived in Eretz Israel, and maybe he's writing that he's calling on Israel Chavatzel Tasharon to give us a little bit of hope. Right? Maybe we're going to bloom again. Right? The damam ron mipinos e aron. The the singing ceased from the carriers of the aron. And the Kohanim move from their Mishmarot, from their traditional cities. Right? And it, as the house was given over to those who were stubborn, who 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 fought against uh, the the hope uh, that Hashem was give uh, the authority that Hashem was giving. Them. But this is also a play on the name, right? And you can see in the map, right, we have the different places, and one of them is Meron. And the first Mishmerit, Yeho Yariv, who is Misarev, Yariv, right, moves to Meron. So we're not going to go into all of these. There are a lot of famous ones like Tsipori, like Sfat, okay? We are going to talk about two particular ones, Yodfat, over here, okay, and Arbel. I think somebody is not muted and they should please mute themselves. Okay, these are two towns in the in the Galil, uh, kind of on the border between the Galil Elyon and the Galil Tachton. The Arbel, very close to Tveria, very close to the Kinneret, and Yodfat, really in the middle of the mountains over here. Um, both of them important places, both of them archaeological sites, and we're going to take a look at each of these uh, as uh, as they are written about in the Kina and also 
in terms of their history. Okay, so Yodfat, let's look at the Kina first and then we'll we'll talk about the history. Uh, uh, gone is the splendor of the people covered in silver. Utmuro uh, al and instead there is there is ashes on their heads. And the candles are extinguished and the menorah is turned over. Because they didn't give uh, bread to the poor. Yodfat Yodfat was captured. So Yodfat was a city already from Hashmonai times. Okay? Uh, according to the Gemara, it's a city that had a wall around it from the time of Yoshua. Archaeologists have only found remains from uh, like second century before the common era, Hashmonai times. Very important city. And when the attack in the Great Revolt begins, right, the Romans come to attack. The Jews rebel against the Romans in the year 66. In the spring of 67, Roman forces commanded by the general Vespasian come to attack. They begin in the Galil, and Yodfat is the first major battle. Uh, it's described to us very carefully by, Yod by Josephus, who's the commander. Okay, This is before Josephus uh, becomes a traitor and, and joins the Roman side. He's the commander of the Galil. He goes, he fortifies Yodfat. You can go today and you can see uh, the wall that's around the top. You can actually see today the, the Parks Authority has come and has put up uh, kind of visual aids, pieces of a battering ram, spears and shields of the Roman invaders. It's actually very evocative. If you stand on top and you look down to where the Romans were, you can really understand the siege that is going on. This is the first major battle, and it's very much a proving ground for both uh, the Jews and the Romans. It, each one of them has a great stake uh, in winning and in capturing your fat. The Romans are on the bottom. The Jews on the top have plenty of food, but they don't have enough water. And the Romans besiege the city in Iyar and in Sivan, okay, beginning of the summer months, very hot, not enough water. Josephus knows that the Romans know that they don't have enough water, and he uses psychological tactics. He tells the people to do laundry and to hang it out on the walls, right? To say, look how much water we have. We have so much water that we can do laundry. But it doesn't matter because the Romans really have um, unlimited resources uh, and they attack using catapults, using arrows, using a battering ram. They finally breach the wall uh, and they break into the city. The people hide out in the cisterns, but the Romans find them uh, and attack them and kill them on the first of Tammuz. We have uh, a crazy story with Josephus himself, who's hiding out in one of the cisterns with many fighters, uh, and, uh, and he tries to convince them to surrender because he understands it's a lost cause. There's no way they're going to be able to survive. They refuse. They want to commit suicide. They draw lots, and Josephus tells about how he rigs the lots so that he is the last one standing. He and another man are the last one standing, and he convinces the other guy not to commit suicide, and then he goes out, and he uh, gives himself up to the general, to Vespasian, a story very similar to the story of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai, except that Josephus is doing it to save his skin, right? Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai is doing it to save the Jewish people. Um, one of the most evocative things that the archaeologists found in Yotfat, besides all the weapons and the cisterns and the bones and everything else, they found a stone that this is a replica of both sides of it, right? Uh, one side has the image of a crab, right? And one side has the image of a grave or a nefesh, really, right? The monument that goes above a grave. And what we think this means, we know that Yodfat fell on the first of Tammuz. Tammuz, the, uh, the zodiac sign for Tammuz is, is a crab. Uh, and the, the nefesh, the, the grave, is a symbol of death. Uh, so here we have somebody in the city who says, we died in Tammuz, that, that's basically what you're seeing here. Um, so Yodfat is a very, very terrible, very powerful story. Later on, it's resettled and the Kohanim come and live there, but its major story is from the time of the Great Revolt. Arbel does not have as terrible or as dramatic a story, fortunately. Uh, it's also uh, a Jewish community that goes back to Hashmonai times. We hear about one of its very famous residents is somebody we hear about in Pirkei Avot called Nitai Ha'arbeli, who's one of the Zugot. He's very, very uh, early on, right? He's before the Hurban Abayit. Uh, the verses of the Kina about Arbel right? Everything, of course, has to rhyme. So, her, her impurity 
covered her defilement, polluted the world. The Rav Chovel is the captain. And of course, the captain is Hashem, right? Hashem goes away, goes up. And a cloud covers his feet like a like a barefoot mourner the ain mit karbel and there is no kohanim putting on their they're not wrapping themselves up in their priestly garments the kohane arbel okay so again the arbel the people of arbel are also mourning the temple um in arbel there's all kinds of dramatic things that we find there's a very dramatic site it's on a cliff i'll show you a picture in a minute of how incredible it is uh, it's located on a cliff. Josephus tells us a crazy story from the time of Herod about how the Jews of Arbel didn't want to accept the authority of Herod, and so they hid out in the caves on the cliffs, uh, but Herod was not deterred, and he sent his soldiers down. He lowered them from the tops of the cliffs in cages to attack the rebels inside the caves. So it's a very, very dramatic sight. Uh, a Beit Knesset discovered there. Um, unclear exactly when it's from, but a very beautiful Beit Knesset that uses some basalt, some local stone, but also some imported limestone, very, very beautiful imported and expensive limestone. Uh, and that's the Beit Knesset of Arbel. But we have uh, an incredible image, a literary image to match with this incredible photographic image. Uh, when you stand up at the top by the Beit Knesset of Arbel, you can see the Bikat Arbel, right? You can see the valley. The cliffs are on one side, and there's this very deep, dramatic valley which goes out to the Kinneret, uh, heading to the east. And you can completely picture this beautiful imagery in the Yerushalmi and Brachot. Rabbi Chia, the elder, and Rabbi Shimon Brachalafter were walking through the Arbel Valley at daybreak. And when they saw the first rays of dawn, Rabbi Chia, the elder, said to Rabbi Shimon ben Chalafter, Berebi, such is Israel's redemption. Kachi Gulatan shal Yisrael. At first, it comes slowly, slowly, kima, kima, and as it progresses, its light increases, right? They saw the Ayala Tashachar, the first rays of dawn, and, and that's exactly what it looks like, right? The light comes up little by little, and then it breaks out into the whole valley, and you can really stand in the Arbel and, and picture this beautiful image uh, of the Geula coming forth. Um, so this idea of the Mishmarot Kuna, uh, as I said, it saved for us by the Kalir in his Piyut. He tells us all these places, but it's also saved for us physically in uh, various archaeological sites where we find these plates that have the Mishmarot Kuna written on them, right? You can see this one here on the left is from a Beit Knesset in Caesarea. There's only a little bit that's left of it, but we know it, right? We know it from other sources, so we're able to fill it in, but we can clearly see the, the Mishmarot, right? It says Mishmeret Shisha, Mishmeret Shisha, Sar, Mishmeret Shiva, Sar, and we can fill them in. Um, another one that's an even crazier one is this one on the right here, which was preserved in its entirety. Uh, it's, a, it's a metal plate from Yemen that was actually found in secondary use in a mosque, right? They clearly didn't know what it said, but they, they liked the plate and they used it. Why would you have these in Batei Knesset? So we have traditions that in Byzantine times, right, long after Furban Abayit, there were Batei Knesset that would recite these Mishmarot, or they would say a piyut in honor of the mishmeret of that week. It was remembered for many, many, many centuries, for a long, long time. Uh, and it seems these Kohanim still lived in various enclaves for a very long time. We have a rabbi from 16th century spot, Rabbi Moshe Basula, who talks about a town called Kfar Hananya, okay? Kfar Hananya, not far from Meron, that was a Kohanim town in his time in the 16th century. Kohanim liked to stick together. It was helpful for them for marriage. It was helpful for them to prepare for the Geula, right? We hear a similar thing in Drom Har Hebron in the southern Hebron Hills. Um, so it, it's, it, it is a fascinating thing that uh, that continued up until not so long ago, up until four or 500 years ago. Um, okay, so we're going to move on from the Kohanim to the martyrs. A uh, very, very famous story that is told in a number of kinot, uh, including on Yom Kippur, and that's of the 10 martyrs, the Aseret Harugei Malchut. Uh, on Yom Kippur, we read one very famous called the Ela Eskara, which has a whole kind of a, an introductory story that talks about Yosef, 
uh, being sold by his brothers and the Roman emperor hears about this and he wants to punish 10 Sadikim like the 10 brothers of Yosef. Uh, on, on Tisha B'Av, we don't have that introduction, uh, but we do have this listing of various martyrs, right? Arzeh HaLibanon, Adirei HaTorah, right? Uh, the cedars of Lebanon, uh, the uh, the strongholds of Torah, Ba'alei Trisin B'Mishnah U'Bigmara, right? The defenders of the Mishnah and the Gemara, these warriors who fought impurity, their blood was spilled and they fought with, with, uh, with bravery. These are the, the 10 martyrs. Now, they, this is written in the 12th century uh, by uh, Mayor Ben Yechiel. It's talking about these great rabbis killed by the Romans. Um, the Ten Martyrs is not a historical document, right? There, some are killed earlier, some are killed later. It doesn't all fit together as one seamless story. However, it, it does tell us about the circumstances surrounding the very, very difficult period of the Bar Kofa revolt, slightly before it, slightly after, uh, the decrees against the Jews, the decrees uh, against Torah learning, hey, things that we didn't really find in the Great Revolt, which was much more about sovereignty and independence and paying taxes. The Bar Kofa revolt is much more about Torah and teaching Torah and keeping Shabbos and circumcision. Uh, and and this, this kina is very much about those teachers and those rabbis and what they did. And we know in the Bar Kofa revolt, Jews uh, used guerrilla warfare. They went and they hid out. We have hideout caves like this all over the Shvela, all over the lowlands of Yehuda. Uh, this is one of them in a place called Hirbit Midras, not far from Beit Shemesh. We found now caves also uh, in the area of the Dead Sea, in the Judean desert, even in the Galil. This, this revolt was in a lot of different places. Um, one of the, the spearheads, the leaders of the revolt, who was of course killed by the Romans in a very spectacular way, probably in Caesarea, is Rabbi Akiva, right? And of course we have Rabbi Akiva here, Me'achara Viviwa Rabbi Akiva, Oker Harim Bitochnan Zoba Zobisvara, right? Rabbi Akiva, the great thinker and 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 uh, user of logic and of of learning sarkut bisaro bimasrek barzel hishtabra they combed his flesh uh, with an iron comb yet tanish matobe echadu bat kol amra right his his soul came out with echad when he said shmai shal shem alokeno shem echad and a heavenly voice said rabbi akiva ashrecha Rabbi Akiva, you are fortunate. Your body is pure in all different ways. But one of the others who uh, who's less well known but is extremely important is uh, Rabbi, ba Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava. And this is the the grave of Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava in Shvaram. Hey, uh, this is a story that's happening when the Jews are already in the north um, and Rabbi Akiva, it, it seems, is no longer and the Romans have outlawed teaching Torah and they've also outlawed rabbinic ordination, right, giving smicha and Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba, according to the story that we're going to read in a minute, uh, sacrifices himself so that smicha can continue, so that there will be another generation of Torah. This is a generation uh, of a Holocaust. This is a generation where the leaders of Torah are decimated. There is no one to teach. And Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba understands that he has to ensure the continuity of the oral law. And so he goes and he sacrifices himself. So just to read the Kina for a minute, and then we'll get to the story about him. Ben Baba, Rabbi Yehuda, acharav heviu b'shivron leiv ba'azhara. Hey, they, he's brought afterwards with... Uh, with a broken heart and being warned, Neharag ben Shivim Shanabi de Rasha He was 70 years old when he was killed by the, the wicked, the evil people. Yoshev betanit hayan akiva chasid bimlachtol demahara. He was sitting in a fast and he was, Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba is described as a chasid, um, that he always was the, the righteous one. Anytime it says an anonymous chasid, says the Gemara, this is Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba. Mishnah uh, he always had the correct answer and the correct uh, misora, but that is not why he is so significant. He's so significant because of this story that we hear in Sanhedrin. Okay? One time the wicked kingdom of Rome issued decrees of religious persecution against the Jewish people. 
They said that anyone who ordains will be killed and anyone who is ordained will be killed and the city in which they ordain will be destroyed and the signs identifying the boundaries of the city in which they ordain will be uprooted. Okay, so not only will the person be killed, but anyone he gives me to will be killed and the cities will get a collective punishment as well. So Rabbi Huda ben Baba has to deal with all of these challenges. What did Rabbi Huda ben Baba do? He went and sat between two large mountains, between two large cities and between two Shabbat boundaries, between Usha and Shfar'am, right? Usha and Shfar'am, we know in our tradition, these are places that the Sanhedrin moves to, okay? But he deliberately sits between them, between the Tchumei Shabbat. We have actually what was found outside of Usha is a stone that says on it in Greek, Tchum Shabbat. Hey, the, the boundary of Shabbat. We actually know that there were boundaries that people didn't go beyond them on Shabbat. Why does he do this? Because he doesn't want either city to be made culpable for what he's going to do. And he ordained five elders. And they were Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Yossi, and Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua. Okay? This, they become the next generation, as we're going to see in this other source here. Rabbi Avia Ezra, Rabbi Nehemia was also among those, them, those ordained. When their enemies discovered them, Rabbi Yehuda said to the newly ordained sages, my sons, run for your lives. My, they said to him, my teacher, what will be with you? Rabbi Yehuda Mavava was elderly and unable to run. He said, in any case, I am cast before them like a stone that cannot be overturned. The Roman soldiers did not move until they had inherited, inserted 300 iron spears into him, making him appear like a sieve pierced with many holes. And now we have a discussion on the Gemara. Does he really ordain Rabbi Meir? Does not Rabbi Akiba ordain Rabbi Meir? But we want to focus on this story of his sacrifice, right? Not only is he too old to run, but he knows that if he stays, the Roman soldiers will come and attack him and the others will be able to escape and they'll be able to continue to teach Torah. Uh, a commentary, a 19th century commentary, the Ben Yishchai uh, from Iraq, who comments on the Gemara, he writes something called the Ben Yehoyada. He, he likes to play sometimes with the words. Uh, and Rabbi Huda Bab Baba says to them, uh, like a stone that cannot be overturned. Uh, and uh, the Ben Yehoyada says, Evan, the gematria of Evan is me'ahava, from love. That everything that Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba does, he does from Ahava, not from Yira. He's doing things in order to keep the Torah alive. Uh, and, and the people that he ordains become the next generation, as we see later on in the Gemara and Sanhedrin. Rabbi Yehoyada says, an unattributed Mishnah is Rabbi Meir. An unattributed Breita is Rabbi Nehemiah. An unattributed Sifra is Rabbi Yehuda. An unattributed Sifrei is Rabbi Shimon. And all of them are Liba to Rabbi Akiva. All of them are in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva is the one who taught the Torah. Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba is the one who ensures that the Torah is going to continue uh, and is going to be taught to the next generation. Okay, moving on quite far ahead in history. Uh, it's Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. Right? Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, if we just uh, want to go back to our timeline for a minute so we don't get too lost, let's just remember. Okay, uh, so we had our story of, uh, of the fall of Yodfat. We had the Bar Kokhba revolt in the 130s, and now we are in uh, the 1100s. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi dies in 1141. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi spends his life, he, he travels, he doesn't stay in one place, but he spends much of his life in Spain, and in Spain that is still a good Spain, right? Spain before the major persecutions, uh, there's Muslim Spain, there's Christian Spain, there are some troubles, but in general we're in what's usually called the golden age of Spain, right, uh, where Jews are flourishing. They're flourishing in terms of uh, their wealth, in terms of their political standing, their social standing. Uh, everything is going well for them. Uh, Rabbi Huda Lady is part of that story. He is a very well-respected member of the community. He's a physician. He is a poet. He has friends all over. And yet, he sees himself as an Asir Sion. Sion. He sees himself as a prisoner because he can't go to Zion, right? It's despite the good life in Spain, he is crying for his suffering in Spain that he wants to be in Eretz Israel, right? The most famous poem by Rabbi Yudah Levi, of course, is Libi ba Mizrach ba Anochi b'Soch Ma'arav, right? My heart is in the east while I am at the ends of the west. I, you know, how can I eat my food? How can anything taste good? He recognizes that he has a good life, but 
he still wants to be in the land of Israel. He wants to be connected uh, to the places that are part of our history, that are part of our story. And he writes this very important kina that we today say towards the end of our keynote in the morning. Zion, hello, tish'ali lishlom asiraich, dorshe shlomech v'heim yeter adaraich. Zion, are you going to ask after the, the well-being, the welfare of your prisoners, right? Again, prisoners are not prisoners. They're living a good life in Spain. No, they're prisoners because they cannot go to Zion. Dorshe shlomech v'heim yeter adaraich. They are always looking out for your your welfare and asking about you and they are the rest of your uh, of your flock from all the different directions, north, south, east, west, everybody is sending their, their good wishes to Zion. Right? Everybody is hoping and wishing to be uh, to be going on your hills. And he goes on in the Kinan, he talks about the various different places around Eretz Israel. I'm a jackal uh, when I cry for your suffering. But when I dream of the return to you, I am a, I am a harp for your songs. I am a, 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 exactly what Naomi Shemer borrows from Yudah Levi uh, when she does Yushalayim Shel Zahav, Aniki Nor Lishiraich. Yudah Levi, like we said, spends his life, most of his life in Spain. Uh, but towards the end of his life, he decides to make good on his desire to come to Eretz Israel. Of course, the most famous thing that Rabbi Yudah Levi wrote is the, the book of philosophy called the Kuzari, where he borrows uh, a, a story that's from centuries earlier about a king of a kingdom called Kazaria, right, in Asia, in Central Asia, uh, who decides that his way of life is not uh, appropriate, and he brings in a philosopher, and he brings in a Christian, uh, and he and a Muslim, and he hears, well, not a Muslim, I think, in the original story, uh, and he hears, you know, which way of life is the best, but the bulk of the book, you know, Rabbi Yudha Levi borrows this idea, this legend, where he brings in a Jew, and he eventually converts to Judaism, and Rabbi Yudha Levi borrows this and creates it as a framework for his book about Jewish philosophy, the Kuzari. And at the end of the book, the king asks the rabbi, okay, well, what are you going to do now? You finished, you've convinced me, we've had our discussion, we've had our conversation, where are you going to go now? And he says he's going to go to Eretz Israel, right? Because it was in throughout the book, he's talking about the land of Israel as the heart in the body and, and, and the most important place that every Jew has to be in. Uh, and Yudah Levi himself decides at the end of his life that he is going to leave Spain and he's going to go to Eretz Israel. So in 1140, he leaves for Egypt. He goes first to Alexandria. Alexandria, and then he goes to Cairo. For a long time, there was a question about whether he makes it to the land of Israel. Um, today, we have Beniza documents that say he does indeed reach the land of Israel. Does he make it to Jerusalem, to the Kotel, to Harabait? Unclear, right? This is 1141. This is uh, not an easy time. The Crusaders, as we're going to see in a moment, uh, are ruling uh, in Jerusalem, does he come? Does he make it? There's a famous legend that he is killed by an Arab horseman on the steps going towards uh, towards Har Habayit. That we don't know yet. Who knows? Maybe we'll find Geniza documents that, that tell us more. Uh, but this is the end of the book of the Khazari. The rabbi was then concerned to leave the land of the Khazars and to go to Jerusalem. The king did not want to let him go and asked him, what can be sought in the land of Israel nowadays? Since the divine reflex is absent from it and with a pure mind and desire, one can approach God in any place. The rabbi answered, the land of Israel is especially distinguished by the Lord of Israel and no function can be perfect except there. Jerusalem can only be rebuilt when is is Israel yearns for it to such an extent that they embrace her stones and her dust. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Huda Levi does indeed set out for the land. Okay, our last story that we're going to talk about uh, is the story of the Crusades. Um, because of the, the horrors first of the Spanish Inquisition, but then mostly of the Holocaust, the Crusades are not as remembered as they should be. Um, even though among Ashkenazi Jews, there still are some traditions in the time of Sfirat HaOmer that are connected to the Crusades. Uh, and we do have some keynotes that are connected to the Crusades. Um, 
people here who may, who may have come to my class that I did on medieval Israel uh, a few months ago, we talked about the Crusades from the perspective of Eretz Israel, and, and we're going to see at the very end that, that in actuality, the Crusades are good uh, ultimately for settlement in the land of Israel, but there's a lot of tragedy that happens before that. This is a very, very, very difficult time in Jewish history, particularly in the communities of Ashkenaz, which see themselves as very learned and pious and and how could anything terrible happen to these wonderful communities so we're going to come to those keynotes uh, about the Rhineland communities but first just uh, a few words about the Crusades so the Crusades are very very significant as you can see in this map right there's a great map from the Middle Ages uh, of the land that was on right America, the Neue Welt is over here in the corner, okay? But this is after America was discovered, but it's very much, you know, off to the side. What's important is Europe, Asia, Africa with Jerusalem, holy Jerusalem in the middle, right? The really the center of the world. Uh, and one thing that the Crusades does, which had not happened for a long time, uh, is it returns Eretz Israel to the center of consciousness, to the center of the world, right? For a very long time, for centuries before the Crusades, the land of Israel is part of the larger Muslim empire. Yes, there's importance to Jerusalem, but it's on the edges of the larger Muslim empire. And the crusade kind of brings the land of Israel back into the center of things. Uh, it also connects Europe to the land of Israel, right? Uh, and Israel becomes the focus of the Western world. So ultimately, there are some good things that come out of the crusades for the land of Israel, although much tragedy along the way. What's the story behind it, right? Why are the crusaders setting out a, uh, in uh, November of 1095, Pope Urban gives a speech uh, preaching in Clermont say, saying how the Christians must go to save the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is what you see in the picture here, uh, from the heretics. A, um, ostensibly, the idea was also to go to Constantinople uh, and Byzantium to save the Christian community there from the Muslim attacks. Um, so the idea of saving Jerusalem, the idea of saving Constantinople, but there are larger reasons at play here. I, um, there's a, a way, this is a way to consolidate the church's power. The church is already extremely powerful, it is the strongest government in Europe, and this is just going to make it more powerful than any individual government. Okay? It's going to reunite the Eastern Church and the Western Church, which have split in half. Um, it's very much a, a religious end of days feeling, right? This is the, the millennium is going to be coming. We have to be in Jerusalem. This is the end of days. And kind of a very practical reason, there's too many younger sons floating around Europe. Hey, uh, if you are a, a feudal lord and you have five sons, only one son is going to inherit your lands. You don't want to divide things up. That's not a good idea. So one son gets land. What are the others doing? One of them might go into the priesthood, but some of them are becoming knights. And all those stories about the knights riding around Europe and you know saving down in distress and fighting dragons, it's not really a good thing. There's a lot of testosterone surging in Europe, and you kind of want to get these guys out of the way. Go, go somewhere else. Take all of that fighting and all of that desire to make something of yourself and to make a living and to win the damsel in distress. Take it away from your right. Go bring it to the land of Israel. Uh, why do people join the Crusades? A lot of different reasons. Um, they, there is religious fervor for sure that we should be very wary of discounting religious fervor uh, and the importance of religion uh, in the medieval world and in the ancient world. Um, but there are also other reasons. You get to see the world in a, in a time period where most people never ventured more than a 10 kilometer radius from their farm. You really get to go and see the world, right? What was that slogan from the Marines? Join the Marines, kill people, see the world. That, that's the Crusades. Um, and you also have an added benefit, which is that the church says, if you go on the crusade and you are killed, you die without sin and you die without debt. 
Okay, these are very, very significant things. You don't need to repent. You don't need to pay back your debt, by the way, who are the debts mostly to the Jewish communities. That's part of our story that we're going to see here. Um, and that's a, that's a strong motivator. And you have alongside the knights and the kings, you have a lot of rabble, right? And that's our story uh, of the Rhineland massacres is what's called the People's Crusade. And people like Peter the Hermit, this is the picture that we have over here on the right, and Count Emilio and people who are really not exactly the most uh, high class people. And they are the ones who come and they attack the Rhineland communities. Um, this Piyut Mi Tem Roshi Mayim, we're going to read it in a second. Uh, it's written by someone named Klonimus Ben Yehuda, who's part of a very famous Ashkenazi family, the Klonimus family. Uh, and he is talking about the tragedies along the Rhineland in the spring of 1096. Okay? The major communities are Mainz or Magenza, okay? Worms, which is here in the middle, but not on my map here, okay? and Speyer down here. Okay. Uh, Ashpira in the in the Kina, and they are all along the Rhine River. Okay, these are wealthy and important Jewish communities. Okay? When Rashi wants to come and learn Torah and bring it back to France, he comes and he studies in these Rhineland communities. Okay? They are wealthy, they are learned, they are important, uh, and they are a target for this people's crusade, okay? Uh, they, they come through here. There's definitely a religious war going on. There's also a desire for money. Um, and we have the king near me, Roshi Maim, Etni, Makor, Nozli, right, Nozlai, the Efket, Kol Yamot, Vilelai, Achalalei, Tapai, Ba'olalai, Vishishay, Kahalai, Batem anu avoy v'oy v'alalai u'bachen b'chod tipker rav v'herev al beit Yisrael v'al am Adonai ki naflu b'cherev. Hey, my eyes should be full of tears. My head should be full of tears to cry day and night uh, over the house of Israel and Am Hashem and the God's people who have fallen by the sword. And fallen by the sword, by the way, is an allusion to King Saul who falls by the sword, right? Who nafel b'cherev, um, because some of these communities commit suicide. Just like King Saul commits suicide, they commit suicide rather than convert, rather than fall to, uh, to the Christian invaders who are coming through. Um, the, the Kina tells us about the dates, okay? We have the Hebrew dates. We also know the English dates from other chronicles, okay? Uh, on May 3rd, uh, on the eighth day of ER, there are Jews who are attacked in Spire, and that's what we have here. Apapai Zumaim Dema Lahagira, the Konein Mar Alei Haruge Ashpira, Bisheni Bishmona Bo, right? On Monday, on the eighth of ER, Bisheni, uh, excuse me, in ER, in the second month, Bishmona Bo, on the eighth day, Biyom Margoa Hukra and Shabbat, Margoa Lirgoa Neflefula Havira, right? Our rest was changed into fire so in the in the kina he says there are 10 uh, uh, scholars today say 12 many of them killing themselves the community then rebuilt itself and this is the mikvah the ancient mikvah that was actually discovered uh in spire um in these communities, there are attempts by the kings and the local leaders and even the bishops to protect the Jews, but the mob is too strong. The mob is too strong and, and they overcome them. Uh, Spire is relatively saved. Um, not too many were killed. Uh, two weeks later, May 18th, Chav Gimel Iyar, they arrive in Erms and they kill at least 800. Uh, and then another 10 days later, Gimel Sivan, right? And the, and the Biot talks about how it's part of the Shloshet Yimei Hagbala. It's the days before Shavuot. Uh, May 27th, uh, at least 1,100 are, are killed in Mainz. So it's very, very terrible moments at a time that is meant to be a time of the Torah being given, and yet the Torah is being destroyed and the scholars of the Torah are being destroyed. Uh, and that's part of the, the whole theme uh, of what's going on 
in the Kina here. Uh, and like we said, there are Ashkenazi communities that even today, uh, many communities still say uh, say the Avarachamim on the Shabbat Mivrachim of Sivan, even though you're not supposed to be saying Avarachamim on Rosh Chodesh uh, on Shabbat Mivrachim, but they say it because Sivan is a very terrible time. Uh, and some people explain that the customs that we have of mourning on Sivan HaOmer are not only about Rabbi Akiva and not only about the time of uh, Bar Kokhba, but they are also about the communities uh, in the Rhineland. Uh, and I know you have a whole class on this, so I'm not going to go into it further, um, but you'll hear more about it. But one last story, um, this is a Kina that is not said by, uh, not said by everybody, but there are some communities that do say that this is for the, uh, the York massacre. Um, Richard the Lionhearted, who is portrayed very much as a hero, but for Jews, he was very much not a hero. Um, he is, uh, he comes on the third crusade when the crusaders have already lost all of Eretz Israel in 1187 to Salah Adin. Uh, Richard the Lionhearted comes a few years later, Third Crusade, and manages to take back half of the land. He takes back Akko. He is an incredibly cruel and, and, and terrible person. He, he massacres prisoners. And of course, he is not particularly good to the Jews either. A couple of years before he comes to the land of Israel, he's crowned in 1189. On the day of coronation, many Jews after are, are attacked. Uh, and then afterwards, in 1190, there's a mob that comes to the Jewish community in York. Uh, the Jews take refuge in the, the tower called Clifford's Tower. The mob attacks them, uh, and most of them commit suicide. And then the tower is later rebuilt. And there's a kina just about Clifford's Tower and about the Jews of York and about the terrible price that they paid. But uh, here in Eretz Israel, it is the afternoon of Tisha B'Av, and this is the time where we start to look a little bit towards Nechama. So we're going to finish with a little bit of a, a story of Nechama, um, even though uh, the Crusades are terrible for the Jews in the Rhineland and on the way, and they are also terrible for the Jews when they arrive here, right? We know that when uh, Baldwin comes, uh, and not Baldwin, Godfrey of Bouillon comes and uh, and conquers Jerusalem, he puts all the Muslims inside the mosque, he puts all the Jews inside the Beit Knesset, locks the doors and sets them on fire. Terrible, terrible stories uh, uh, of, uh, of massacres of the Jews and of the Muslims. But what ironically happens is that because the Crusaders kind of open up travel to the land of Israel, okay, uh, more and more Jews start to come. Uh, and the, the, the kingdom of Jerusalem in Akko becomes a very important Jewish center. We hear about rabbis, right? The traditional number is 300 rabbis. It might not be so many, but we definitely have rabbis who come and who settle in Akko. Okay? We have Jewish communities that are rebuilt. Uh, and one of the most powerful stories that we have is the Ramban, right? Who's coming towards the end, the Crusaders are about to leave. The Crusaders are already not in Jerusalem anymore. Uh, the Mamluks are coming into Jerusalem, but the Ramban is, uh, is kicked out of Spain because of his part in the disputation. And he makes his way to the land of Israel and he comes first to Jerusalem and then to Akko. He rebuilds both communities. Uh, this is a picture of the Beit Knesset Haramban in Jerusalem. Uh, and this is a piece of the letter that he writes to his son uh, in El 1267 from Jerusalem. What shall I tell you about the land? The sum of it is that the holier the place, the worse the destruction. Jerusalem is more desolate than the rest of the land, Judah more than the Galilee. Yet for all its destruction, it is wonderful. It has nearly 2,000 inhabitants. There are no Israelites among them. There are only two dyers who purchase dye from the government unto whom a minion gathers for prayers in their house on Shabbat. I encourage them and we found an abandoned building with marble pillars and a lovely arch which we converted into a synagogue. For the city is wide open and anyone who wishes to take possession of an abandoned building can do so. People have contributed to the refurbishing of the building and we have already sent to the city of Shechem for Torah scrolls that have been sent there for safekeeping. Whoever is privileged to see the temple and its destruction will be privileged to see it rebuilt and repaired when the divine presence returns to it. Okay, let's see what comments, what questions we have. Uh, uh, okay. 
He was drowned en route from Israel to Alexandria. I'm not sure. As far as I know, the Geniza documents talk about him making it to Eretz Israel, but I would have to go back and check. Yushayim, yes. Is, uh, Chazal also talk about Yushayim as the center of the world. Um, the Six-Day War on those dates, right, those dates in Sivan, you're talking about Batya, yes. Um, the Crusades, the power of the church. From, the the from the 26th of the year, Yes, and yes, so, exactly. The story of the Crusades. Um, how would the power of the church be felt in the life of the average person? Well, first of all, Jews in any medieval town, right? The church is the most important building. You're walking through the church. Uh, in many of them, particularly in Germany, you're seeing statues of Ecclesia and Synagoga, right? Ecclesia is this proud, beautiful woman with a crown, and Synagoga is bent over with no crown and a broken staff. So you're definitely feeling that you are a second-class citizen, besides all of the rules in various places, uh, you know, restrictions on economic life and what Jews were allowed to do. Um, the keynote for the massacre at Clifford's Tower. I don't, let me see if I can find it in, or if Rabbi Kalman knows it offhand. I know I have it written down. I'm going to look. Um, the, 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 uh, the one for the Crusades are all from 21 to 25. No, but the Kedoshe York here. Elokim Ba'alunu Zulatcha Adanim. And there's another one, Mati Tapchi Cherev. It's not in all the Sifrei Kinot, um, but it definitely is in some that the ones that have the like really comprehensive list, like in that nice one, the the English one. What's the, the I, I don't have it on my desk right now, but the I'm core, sure I mean, it. as far as I know, I have to check. Up, go check but uh, in the standard yes, Kinot, there are four, but I don't know. I don't know. I just know me Tain Roshimayim. Um, yeah, Rosenfeld, TV. that's the one. Right. But I thank know you. That. Barbara I know that. Fessel says Mizrahi TV ha .org has the York Kina on location. Yeah, I've seen that. It's really, it's it's very powerful. There's a Rav who goes there and he reads the Kina, and uh, it is very worth watching. Not to take away from Torah in motion, only when you have a short break between your Torah in motion classes. What did they use to kill themselves? They had they had knives, they had swords. We, they talk about, there's, there's all studies about how they compare themselves to the Akeda, uh, and Avram gave one son, and they are giving all their sons. And by the way, there, there are questions later on. Uh, there's a famous uh, Bali Tosfod who says, well, you know, a few years later, there was a Rav who told everybody to kill themselves. And then a few years later, the Crusaders disappeared and people could re revert back to their Judaism. And how could they have killed all those little children? Right. It, it was a controversial point. It, it was not so simple, but they saw it like the Crusaders saw it as a religious war. But I, I don't uh, I, I don't want to get into the whole Crusader story because I know you have a whole class on it. Well, listen, that's, uh, you know, you know, Chaim Soloveitchik has written a lot about that, mm -hmm. so, that whole issue in his writings. Anyways, but okay. Thank you, Shuli. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a, like literally a three minute break, three and a half minute break. And then uh, Rabbi Israel will begin uh, the story of Martha Baitos. Uh, that will just begin in the, about three minutes or so. So Shuli, thank you. And uh, I guess you can break the fast pretty soon. And the second half day, and I agree with what you said at the beginning, that we should hear good news from, from the land of Israel. That, uh, Amen. So I'm okay. to everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you. We'll just hold on. We don't have to go anywhere. Just the same channel. Right. Uh, Time to cook. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.